Hi, good evening, uh, everyone. Good evening, all of you all. Uh, today, uh, what I'm going to do is a repeat class of uh, what we did a couple of days back. The, the presentation was not very clear. Voice was not audible. So I hope today the things will be much better. It's a repeat class what we are having today. And the uh, subjects what I'm going to cover up is the tangible and intangible assets non-current assets, and control accounts, and cost of sales and inventory. So let's hope how it goes. Uh, tomorrow, we are going to have a special class, an uh, extra class. Tomorrow, we will be looking at lots of questions. And already, there are 75 questions in the Dropbox. I'm going to look at most of those questions. Anyone who is not very clear about how to get those questions, either you can send me an email, then I will send you the questions in advance, or you can send an email to uh, ultimate access. Test dates, y'all can decide it. Every day the exams are happening. Any day, you have to decide when you are ready, you can go and sit for exam. That's how the exams are happening. Uh, you don't need to, uh, there is no last day. Now these are computer-based exams. You can sit at any time. Yeah. So uh, you can speak to your local SEMA office and they will tell you about the examination procedure and um, that way you can do the exam. Yeah. Okay, right. Thanks, Miraj. Okay, so what we are going to do is we are going to uh, do some questions, uh, some slides today. That is a repeat lesson of what we did. I'm recording this lesson. So anyone who did not have a good recording last time will be able to share this recording uh, to Ultimate Access. And uh, also, uh, tomorrow, I invite all of you all to join the class because tomorrow we will look at as much as possible questions uh, during a two-hour session. Uh, and then, till you sit the exam, my idea is you all must do many questions. Same question, even repeating, it's all right, but you must do questions. If you all have any problems, send me an email. We will reply you all those things. We will support you every possible way, but we need you all to get through these uh, papers. So today, uh, the subject is tangible and intangible assets. Yeah. You remember, we get money, we get business funds from the capital investments, the owners or the shareholders, and also through various loans, what we call debt capital, loan capital. And all those monies are invested to buy assets. So there are two kinds of assets what we have, non-current assets and current assets. Non-current assets are essentially assets which are held to be kept in the business for, to be used for more than one year. So they are based, earlier they were called fixed assets. So property, plant, and equipment that a company purchases is not meant to be disposed tomorrow, day after, or within three months. They are meant to be kept to be used to generate revenue, to generate income. And they are what we call the non-current assets. So non-current assets, you can further classify tangible assets and intangible assets. So immediately we are looking at the tangible assets. Tangible assets are the assets that we use to produce or supply goods or services. So property, plant, and equipment are the main non-current assets, the tangible assets. The other kind of assets is what we call current assets. They are essentially moving from one day to the other. You remember the three types of current assets we have, inventory, trade receivables, and cash. Inventory is what we mean what, what is there for us to sell. So today you will have one kind of inventory, I mean one 
amount of inventory. Tomorrow it will be sold, a new inventory will come. Part of the inventory will be sold day, day, day after, a part of the inventory will come. So it is moving all the time. Inventory is something that is why we call it a current asset. Receivables is the money we have to receive from our customers when we sell on credit. And that also, it's a moving. Tomorrow some person will pay, day after tomorrow you will give new credit, and it is moving every day. Cash in hand is also cash at bank, cash in hand is also similar. Today you will have a big balance, tomorrow you will pay your suppliers, the balance will come down, day after tomorrow some person will settle you the money, the balance will go up, so they are fluctuating assets. Non-current assets, the, essentially the property plant and equipment will not fluctuate that fast. And they are actually, uh, essentially they will be kept for more than one accounting period. The minimum is one accounting period. It can last for um, five years, 10 years, 15 years. It depends on the useful life period of the asset. So uh, say for example, a computer may be the useful life period, maybe three to four years. Vehicle, it may be the useful life period, maybe three to four, five years. A plant could stay in for more than five years. Buildings could be there for more than uh, 20 years, maybe 20 years. So there are different, different kinds of assets, property, plant and equipment, which will have different life period, but minimum should be at least one year. The relevant standard is the IA 16, the International Accounting Standard 16, so there we have a couple of terminology we want to discuss. The number one, what we call the carrying amount, the cost, depreciable amount, and depreciation. So, for example, if you buy a machine today, if you buy a machine today for $100,000 or whatever the currency, that will be your cost. is your cost. Let's assume that this asset, we will have a life period, the useful life period or economic life period of five years. Five years is life period. Let's assume after five years, we can sell this asset for 20,000. That's what they call residual value. After using it for the useful five-year period, we can sell it for 20,000. That's what we call residual value. So, the cost is 100. Residual value is 20. So, what we call depreciable amount is cost minus residual value. Hundred thousand is the original cost. Residual value is twenty thousand. Depreciable amount is eighty thousand. And let's assume this has a useful life period of five years. So annual depreciation will be sixteen thousand. So every year in your financial statement you will charge 16,000 depreciation. What is the entry you will put? Debit depreciation with 16,000, which is an expenditure, which will go to the profit and loss, and credit provision account, 16,000. So at the end of the first year, your cost will be 100,000. You will have a provision for depreciation of 16,000. So your carrying amount is 100,000 minus 16,000.
So at the end of the first year, cost minus accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation provision. So after one year, it is 16,000 gone, 84,000 is the carrying value. Now, what is the carrying value at the end of the second year? Second year also, you will put entry. You will debit depreciation second year with 16,000, which will go to the PNL, profit or loss, and the provision for depreciation 16,000, you will credit it. So now in the provision for depreciation after two years, you will have 16 first year, second year 16, now you will have 32,000. That's a carried forward balance. So what is the carrying amount after two years? Hundred thousand minus thirty-two thousand, sixty-eight thousand will be the carrying amount. So the terminology what we have is asset is always recognized after deducting accumulated depreciation from the cost. Hundred thousand is the cost after first year accumulated depreciation is sixteen. After two years accumulated depreciation is thirty-two. After three years accumulated depreciation will be forty-eight and so on and so forth. There will be some impairment losses. I'll come to that in a minute. But for the moment, you can assume carrying value is cost minus accumulated depreciation. And this figure, normally we call it book value. This is the figure that the, the statement of financial position will show the value of the asset. Sometimes it is called the net book value. Sometimes it is called the book value. And that is what we uh, what, we are, what we show in the statement of financial position. So always in the financial position, the figures appear at the carrying amount. Cost is what we incurred to bring that asset into, the, into use. So 100,000 may be the original cost, but after depreciation, the figure is the carrying amount, whatever, it can be 84, 68 or 40, uh, 40, uh, 68 minus 16, 52, like that, it will go on. Depreciable amount is the cost of the asset, 100,000, less its residual value, 20,000. That's the, the, the depreciable amount. And that amount divided by the number of uh, uh, years is what we call the annual depreciation on straight line method. Now, sometimes companies may decide your depreciation is much more faster in first year. It's not equal every year. Because first year, your wear and tear is more. So they might think of providing depreciation on a written down value method. In that case, it will be a slightly different calculation. I'll come to that in a minute. Any questions you have, you can just put it on the chat box. I will answer. So there are a few more terminology. The fair value. The fair value is after a couple of years, if you want to exchange the asset, if you want to sell the asset to an unrelated party, to a party on a commercial term, that's what we call arms and transaction. That is what we call the fair value. So you remember that I told you this particular asset that we had, it, the Cost was 100,000, residual value was 20, 80, and it was five years, 16,000 depreciation. So after two years, my carrying value of the asset was 100 minus 32, 68,000. After two years, my value is 68,000. At that time, they might find the fair value. That is, if you want to sell this asset, the value that they can get, that is what we call the recoverable amount. In a minute, I'll come to that one. 68,000 is the carrying value. And they might find what we call the 
the, the recoverable amount can be 60,000. So 68 is carrying value, but we say the, the, the directors might estimate that the recoverable amount is only 60. In that case, we have suffered what we call impairment. So, carrying value of 68 minus recoverable amount, 8,000. I will have to charge it to the PNL straight away. So, every year, you must try and do something called to see whether there's impairment loss. This is what we call impairment loss. Remember the impairment loss is the carrying value minus the recoverable amount. So now I come to what is called recoverable amount. Recoverable amount is the higher of the two net realizable value and the value in use. So let's assume that we can dispose this asset for 70,000 or no, 65,000. And dispose it for 65,000 and to dispose that one we need to spend 6,000 for expenses selling expenses so the net realizable value is the disposal value minus selling expenses in this case I'm assuming it is 6,000 The net realizable value is 59,000. Now, recoverable amount is the higher of net realizable value of value in use. Value in use is actually not something in your syllabus at the moment. I mean, you don't need to calculate it, but the examiner might give you the value in use. That is, if I use the asset, what is the value for me? On the, uh, we can discount our income, what we can get out of that, and what we call the present value of use in the asset, let's assume the present value of use in the asset is 60,000. Next realizable value is 59,000. Value in use is 50,000. And therefore, the recoverable amount is higher of the two, which is 60. So the current value was 68. The recoverable amount is higher of the two, net realizable value is 59, value in use is 60, the difference we consider it as an impairment and write it off. So now the new asset, not the new asset, the asset will now appear not at 68, it will appear at 60. So after two years, it will now appear at 60. Now surely, we have considered the residual value. So again, now you can't think of another residual value. So this 60 will need to be depreciated over the next couple of years. If it is three years, we will depreciate it next three years at the rate of 60 minus three times uh, divided by three. Because when we arrive at the recoverable amount, we have considered the residual value also. So again, you can't have another residual value. Residual value is always if you go for the full life period of the asset, when you want to dispose, how much can we recover? So useful life period is just generally the, the available life period of the asset, what you can use economically. Now, as I said the other day, a car, company might buy a car, maybe after four years, the company thinks it's not useful because the manager needs a new car to motivate the manager or the business needs a new vehicle, you will sell it. It does not mean the car's life period is four years, but for you, it is only four years. After four years, you are not interested in keeping the vehicle. Machines are the same. You will sell the machine. Some other person will buy your second-hand machine and will use it for another 10 years. That does not matter. For, from your point of view, the useful life period is four years or five years. Because after that, you think you have to spend more money on expenditure, which is not worth.
So initial recognition, all property, plant, and equipment that is tangible asset should be initially measured at cost, whatever the cost. Now the cost can be many things. Now, if you buy a machine, you are in Dubai, you buy a machine from Singapore, which will cost you 100,000, whatever the currency. So that is what you pay to the supplier. But to ship that and bring it to your factory, you may have to spend another 20,000. But you can ship in charges. And after bringing it, you have to install it. That's 10,000. So this is what we call the cost. All the costs that we incur right up to bring that to, to put it to use. I mean, buying the machine in Singapore is not worth. You have to bring it to Dubai. And even bringing it to Dubai is not worth. You have to install it. Then only you can use it for production of goods or services. So everything included, that is what we initially recognize as cost. In this case, this will be 130,000, the purchase price, plus whatever that cost that you have to spend to bring it to the location, and also to install, maybe you have to spend some 5,000 rupees for a consultant to install it, that is also part of cost. There is this last part of it you don't need to worry about, that is mostly for uh, oil exploration kind of thing. If you buy a land from the government, after 10 years, you have to restore the land and give it. So the present value of restoration also must be included at cost, but that's not part of your syllabus. I'm not going to look at that one, but remember the original 100,000 plus the 10,000 bring it shipping and plus the 10,000 will be your cost. Normally, after bringing the asset into existence, whatever that you incur generally after that is considered revenue expenditure and charged to the statement of profit or loss. So to service the machine, to, uh, to, to uh, color wash the building, to repair the computer equipment, all that will be considered revenue expenditure and will be charged to profit or loss as expenditure. But there may be certain expenditure which will stand for capitalization. Now let's assume that you have bought a, a machine um, or rather you have put up a building, a hotel building, uh, 50 rooms you have put up and that has cost us 100 million. Now you want to in, in, uh, uh, put up 20 more rooms. Now that is going to improve your future economic benefit. Color washing the 100 rooms will not make improvement. If you don't color wash, people will not come. If you don't replace the linen and the furniture, people will not come. But putting up 20 more rooms, that is going to increase. So if you're going to spend another 40 million for that, And be capitalized. So where you have a future economic benefit. One thing. Then maybe you have bought an airplane for 50 million dollars. And after using for some time, you find that you have to uh, you have to uh, uh, replace the engine. So the value of the engine at the moment, the carrying value of the engine part, or maybe the, the interior, C interior, you have to replace it. The present value is, the present carrying value is 10 million. Remove 10 million, and then if you are going to replace it, if you're going to spend another 30 million, 30 million, the subsequent expenditure 30 million can be added provided the major component what you are going to replace is de-recognized. De that 10 million you de-recognize. 
you remove that 10 million and bring another 30 million. So that will be allowed for capitalization. And if it's a major inspection or a major fault, like engine repair, again the same story, you have to remove that first part of the expenditure, de-recognize, include the new one, that will be allowed. So normally, subsequent expenditure is treated as PNL. There are few, a few exceptional situations, extension to a building, additional capacity to a, to, a, to, a, to a plant, or when you replace a major component. You know, we remember that we did a, we did a, we did a, a replacement of a $200 something. No, that we will not capitalize it. Not little, little amount. It has to be something very substantial, something very material. So material, it depends on your figures. If it's a company that is dealing with 1,000 million, 2,000 million transactions, even $5,000 will not be material. But if it's a business dealing with 10,000, 15,000, 5,000 will be material. So that's a, a kind of a judgment you will do it. And any cost of a major inspection for false carrying out, the previous inspection is de-recognized. So you, you send some new people and do an inspection. And for that, you have to spend 100,000. But earlier, so you have done some inspection, you have spent 20,000. Remove that 20,000, at the 100,000. So you have to have a deal recognition all the time. Whenever there's a component replacement. Only thing that will, without a component replacement, what can be capitalized is that you have future economic benefits increasing. So mostly, after the cost recognition, we have to provide depreciation. So there are two methods we can value. One is what we call the historical model or the cost model. That is what we were discussing. Original cost was 100. Accumulated depreciation for two years is 32,000. 68,000 is the carrying value, that is what we call historical cost model. Historical cost model. However, I have 16 permits, another model, which I would believe is a better model, but some people use it, some people don't use it. That is what we call the revaluation model. So the cost model, you can see, it is a cost minus accumulated depreciation minus any impairment. So uh, 68,000, if, if it is impaired by 8,000, that will be the cost model, 60,000. But the revaluation model means you try to find out the value, the fair value every year. The fair value. Fair value means if you do a arm's length transaction, what is the value? Now, for example, land, most of the times we revalue it because the lands are going up in price. So we will revalue the land. So uh, buildings we can revalue. That is after some time the building value has gone up. So maybe what was 68,000, now we see it is 75,000. The fair value is 75,000. So what is the revaluation amount? Accumulated depreciation right at the moment is 32. 32. Let's assume we have 8 million, uh, 8 million uh, impairment. So the revaluation model will carry the asset at 35 million. 75 was the fair value. We remove the total accumulated depreciation. Now you can see what happened because originally we had 100 minus 32, 68. But now we see the revaluation. It has come down to 75. 75 minus 32, 43 minus 835. Sometimes maybe the fair value has gone up to 125. Yes, 125 minus 32. 
minus 8, the revalued figure will be 85. So you have to increase from 68, you have to increase it to 85. Here, earlier situation, from here to reduce it. So that you do through what we call a revaluation result. The companies can use both these models, but you have to decide which category, which model you are using. You can use, for example, buildings, you can use the revaluation model. In that case, every building, you have to use revaluation model. You can't use it for one building revaluation, one building cost. No. You can use revaluation for every building. Proper plan, we can go on the historical cost model. So every plant, whatever, will be historical cost model. Equipment, we can go with the historical cost. So you have to decide. Once you decide you can't change it, then that will remain for all the assets of that category. If you are going the land revaluation model, all lands will go for revaluation model. You can't have one land at revaluation, one land at cost model. No. Building, you are going for cost model. All the buildings should be cost model. That's the way you have to do it. That's what the idea is. Perfect. So, depreciation, as I said, is not a drop in the value. Many people think depreciation we need to provide because of there's a value drop and some argue there's no value drop and you don't need to provide depreciation. Depreciation is for the use of the asset, the wear and tear. When you use asset, you have to charge expenditure, a consumption, because you're using it. So you have to charge because you're using the vehicle. You must charge something to the p &A. So it's a systematic allocation of your consumption of that particular asset, that is what we call depreciation. Most of the, the people think depreciation is because the value is coming down, we have to depreciate it. Today you and I will realize most of the assets will have a value much more sometimes because of inflation than what we bought. But that does not prevent us from making depreciation. Depreciation, we look at the initial cost, at the time when you buy what is the residual value, the difference, we will charge it over a period on a very systematic way, either on a straight line method, on a reduced imbalance method, and you will go in. So depreciable oh. amount is the cost minus residual value, 100 minus 20. Depreciation will be recognized in the PNL as an expenditure. Land is not depreciated. The reason is not because the lands are going up in price. Remember, lands is not depreciated because it has an unlimited life. That's the reason why the land is not depreciated. Most of us think land is not depreciated because the value is going up. No. It is because it has an unlimited life. Buildings, it will be depreciated even though it may value appreciate in value because it is subject to depreciation. It has a life period. Just because you maintain your asset very well, it does not mean that you don't need to depreciate. You buy a Mercedes-Benz car, you maintain it so well, beautifully maintain it, one might argue and say you don't need to depreciate. No, you have to depreciate it. Because you're using the vehicle and that must get depreciated. And if the residual value is greater than the carried value, then the depreciation charge can be zero. So maybe after two years, you might find the carrying value is 68,000 and at that time you might find the residual value to be 75,000. Yes, you don't need to provide depreciation. Depreciation will be zero because your carrying value is 68, residual value is 75, depreciation will be zero. But next year when it comes, your carrying value will be 52, another 16 gone. Maybe residual value is 70. Still no depreciation. Next year, residual value will come, carrying value will come down to 36. Residual value 
could be, let's assume, could be 20. So now again, you can see there's a depreciable amount of 16,000. So you have to find out at this point, what is the estimated useful economic life of this asset? Maybe one, one year or maybe two years. Is you will charge 8,000 to the PNE. So this is what we do with the depreciation. So uh, normally in practice, we don't find this kind of a residual value exceeding that kind of a thing. But remember, our examiner can give any questions, so I want you to know these things. So just because you do repairs and maintenance, it does not mean that you need not depreciate. area is not tested by the examiner, so that's why I took uh, extra class. Changes in depreciation method. So we have two methods of depreciation. One we call straight line method. The one we call it residual reducing balance method, written down value method. For example, you might have asset 100,000. Residual value is 20,000. amount is 80,000, you might decide to depreciate it over equal life period. Sixteen thousand will be depreciation every year. Or sometimes you might think first year the, dip, the, the depreciation is more, as you go on the depreciation comes down. In that case you will take this 80,000. You will depreciate maybe over a period of four years or maybe five years, let's assume. But what we will do is we will take the of the 80,000, 20% first year, because we are going for five years, that means 20%. So there you have to give a, a, give a, a percentage. So 20%, let's assume the 20% is your depreciation rate. So first year you will provide 80,000, 20%. Sixteen thousand. Next year, you provide twenty percent of sixty-four thousand. So twelve thousand eight hundred will be next year depreciation. So you can see it's not going to be twenty thousand equally. It will be a different figure. So sixty-four thousand minus twelve thousand eight hundred. Fifty one thousand two hundred twenty percent of this one. So you can see the depreciation figure will come down. First year it was sixteen, second year it is twelve thousand eight hundred, uh, third year it will going to be uh, ten thousand two hundred forty. So that way you can decide the depreciation method. Either whether you can provide reducing balance or you can go on straight line method. That can be reviewed periodically. So, and you might decide you want to change it from straight line to reduce in balance or from reduce in balance to the straight line method. If you decide to change it, it is only a matter of change in your estimate. It's not a change of your accounting policy. So, I want you to remember this one. It's a not a change of accounting policy. It's a change of your estimate. You think it is going to remain five years? Now you think, no, it is going to remain seven years. You think the earlier annual depreciation is all right, but now you think, no, it must be more on the first year, second year, less, that kind of a thing. That kind of a change in depreciation method 
it's only a change in the accounting estimate and it's not a change in accounting policy and therefore the comparative figures need not be altered. So I remember someone asked me, isn't it uh, having an impact on consistency? In a way, it's true. But we are basically, we are in the business of estimated figures. Our estimates can go right, estimates can go wrong. We want to go the best possible estimate, and therefore it is not a change in accounting policy, and therefore no need to change the comparative figures. However, if you change your depreciation policy from historical cost method to revaluation method, that's a change in policy. Because that's not an estimate change. You are basically changing your policy. The revaluation was the earlier method. Now you are going to the, going to the uh, historical cost method. Or earlier it was historical cost method. And now it is revaluation method. That's a change in accounting policy. That case, the comparative figures must be restated. One more estimate that what we can change or which will change is the useful life period. You might, on originally when you bought the asset, you would have thought you can use it for 10 years. But after three years, you find, oh no, you can't go for three or seven, no, seven more years. Competitor has introduced a new product, new machine, and my machine is getting outdated. So I have to write it off over a period of four years or maybe three years. So that's a change in useful life period. Or my residual value. I originally thought it's 20,000, but now I find I can get 30,000. So my depreciation figure will change because I changed the useful life period or because I have changed my residual value. If that happens, it's a change in the estimate again, and because of that, you don't need to again change the prior year figure. So, in summary, if you change your depreciation method from reduce in balance to straight line, or from straight line to reduce in balance, or if you change the useful life period from five years to eight years, or five years to two years, or if you change the residual value from 20 to 30, you don't need to restate the figures because there are changes in accounting estimate. However, if you change your accounting policy of charging depreciation from revaluation method to the cost method or from cost method to revaluation method, that's a change in accounting policy. The figures need to be readjusted. Restated. As I said, year 16 permit you to show our assets at revalued figures or at costless depreciation figures. So revalued figure is the fair value. So you have to do a, a proper revaluation. And once you do the revaluation, uh, that figure can be taken up. So the, normally the revaluation methods are either the market approach. Look at the market value of the land. You can revalue it. You can look at the cost approach. Today, if you want to uh, buy this asset, what is the cost? You can go on that one, replacement cost basis. Or you can look at the value of the asset in terms of future use. That is actually not part of your syllabus. That is trying to discount the present value of future use. And that's what we call the income approach. So either way, you can do it. Uh, this is one rare standard where the people are permitted, given an option, either to use the revaluation method or cost method. So far, both the methods are acceptable. But as, as I told you, remember, for one category of assets, if it is land, if you go on revaluation, all lands must go on revaluation. You can't have one land on revaluation, one land on historical cost, that's out. When you revalue the assets, whatever the depreciation that was there already accumulated should be removed because now no more carrying value because you have a new revalued figure and 
then depreciation will be based on the revaluation figure. So maybe hundred percent the cost asset, two years gone. Thirty thousand, thirty-two thousand, and carry in value is sixty-eight. At this point, you revalue this asset, and the revalued figure is hundred and forty thousand. That's what we call the fair value, hundred and forty. Remove that accumulated depreciation. I'm assuming no income. Remove the accumulated depreciation. The new figure is hundred and eight thousand. So this hundred and eight thousand. Now we have to see what is the useful life period. Okay, three years. In that case, my new depreciation will be thirty-six thousand. A revalue, and therefore my new asset value is hundred eight. My new life period is three years. Further life, additional life, or further life, three years, and my depreciation will be thirty-six thousand a year. Early, I was charging sixteen thousand a year, but now, from now on, was next three years, it will be thirty-six. Revaluation frequency it can be annual, it can be after five years, it can the company can decide, but it must be done on a very consistent basis, and it depends on the volatility. If there's so much of uh, changes in the figure, you may have to do revaluation annually. So revaluation should be carried out by professionally qualified valuers. The directors just can't do it. They must get professionals employed to do the revaluation. So whenever an asset is disposed, now you remember asset will appear in the balance sheet at the carrying value. That is cost minus accumulated depreciation. My case, it says the cost is hundred thousand. After two years, accumulated depreciation is thirty-two thousand. This asset will be carried out at sixty-eight thousand. Let's assume at this point you decide to sell this asset. So the profit or loss on sale of the asset will be because the carrying value is sixty-eight. If we can sell it for seventy-five thousand, it will be a profit of seven thousand. So you look at the net disposal proceeds. Net disposal is after whatever the brokerage you have to pay or whatever. You get seventy-five thousand into your hand. The carrying value of the asset was sixty-eight thousand. Seven thousand will be a profit. If the net disposal proceeds are fifty thousand. It will be a loss of eighteen thousand. So profit or loss will be treated in the statement of profit or loss the moment to dispose the asset. The moment to dispose the asset, the cost figure hundred thousand must be transferred out to a disposal account. Open up a disposal account. Credit the cost figure hundred thousand. This account and debit that hundred thousand to the disposal account. Because you have the asset, your accumulated depreciation also should be disposed. Debit accumulated depreciation with thirty-two. Credit disposal account with thirty-two thousand. And now, if you get seventy-five thousand money, debit cash. Credit seventy-five thousand to the disposal. Which has credit seventy-five thousand. Now balance the account. Seventy-five 
7% will go to the PNL as a profit. You debit disposal account, credit PNL as a gain on sale of asset 7,000. So that is how, that is how you will dispose assets. Any questions, please put it on the chat box. I will answer. With that, I finished up the tangible assets. I told you there are two kinds of non-current assets. The second one is intangible assets. So I want to quickly look at the intangible assets now. Right? Intangible assets are basically uh, there is no physical substance. I mean, you know there is value, but it is it doesn't have a physical substance like a property, plant, or equipment. So uh, basically, it can be your brand name, it can be your franchise name, it can be your reputation, it may be your patent rights because you have developed a new product with exclusive rights, uh, some kind of a that kind of a thing where you have a legal right. Uh, no one can copy it. It's a copyright. These kind of a things are what we call intangible assets. This can be very, very useful in a business because you see, uh, sometimes when you go to buy a T-shirt or something like that, we look at the branded product and we pay a premium for the because it's branded. The crocodile T-shirt, crocodile shirt, we will pay a big price and buy it. Maybe you have another unbranded product, but we are not prepared to pay it. So because they are something which is not tangible, but because it's something valuable, that has a value. We go to the McDonald's and we buy a burger because it's McDonald's burger. We go to the KFC, Kentucky Fried, and we buy a Kentucky Fried Chicken because it is KFC. So that's what the intangible asset is. We go to we buy Coca-Cola because it is Coca-Cola, the brand. Right? So it's uh, basically there's some value in those intangible assets. So to deal with this, we have a standard. Remember the, non, the tangible assets we dealt with IS-16, the standard here is IS-38. So intangible assets should be only recognized. Now, unlike the tangible assets, there is no uh, automatic recognition. Only it should be recognized if there is huge economic benefits flowing and the asset can be measured reliably, of course, that apl applies even to normal tangible assets. But, and all intangible assets, just like the tangible assets, should be measured at cost. Cost will include the purchase price that you have to pay a license fee or whatever, that cost price, and any other things what you have to do to prepare the asset for intended use. You have to register the patent rights you have to do something, all those expenses can be considered as cost. So, again, just like tangible assets, it must bring a future probable economic benefit. It should be measure, it should be measurable, and in that case, it is treated at cost. Cost is always, just like in the tangible assets, initial purchase price plus whatever expenditure we need to use, put it to bring it to the intended use. So there are two types of intangible assets. One is what we call internally generated. You know, after working in a company, when a company works for about 10, 15, 20 years, they have built up a reputation. That's an internally generated intangible asset. People buy your product because you have been there in business for a long number of years. Marmite have been there in business for so many years. People buy Marmite. People buy craft cheese. People buy Coca-Cola. So those are what we call uh, internally generated. Sometimes you might purchase an intangible asset. You buy the brand name of another company. You buy a company along with the brand names. You buy it for the sake of brand name. Some of these um, top brand names like Nokia, um, you know, they have a big value. So you can buy that one. So internally generated, could be the goodwill or other assets. Goodwill is something, it's your reputation. There can be some other assets like your name, like your customer network, all that. However, 
none of these things will be recognized. Internally generated things, the internally generated good deal is never recognized. And other internally generated assets can be recognized. It's something like development expenditure. You try to develop a product, you try to uh, do some research and do development, then it could be recognized certain criteria need to be made under IS 38. If you buy a subsidiary, you have a goodwill arising, that can be recognized because you have paid some money that is coming up under IFR history, but that's not part of your syllabus. It's business combination, it's not part of your syllabus. I'm going to look at the purchase intangibles. That is where you pay money and buy a brand name, pay money and buy patent, pay money and buy technology, pay money and buy licenses or franchises or whatever it may be. Those things so known as you can separately recognize. And if it has a limited life period, maybe life is a license is for five years for you to operate under that particular name. Franchise is given for 10 years for you to operate it. That figure will have to be amortized. So the counter word done in tangible assets is depreciation. For intangible assets, it is amortization. Same theory, you have to amortize it over the useful life period. Tangible assets you amort depreciate over the useful life period. Intangibles you amortized over the useful life period. It should be subject to annual review. That is where you don't have a finite life period. That is where you don't have a limited life period or life period is not defined. Every year you have to do an impairment review and see whether it is dropping in that case providing. But you can't put it up. So originally you bought it for 20 million, whatever, and it has an infinite life period. So if it has gone up to 25, you can't put it up. But if it comes down to 18, you must immediately write off the 2 million. This is what I was talking about, the subsidiaries, which is not part of your area. But if, if you have in, uh, acquired the intangible as a part of business combination, and when you buy a subsidiary, you pay some extra money, that's what we call goodwill, and that can be recognized as a goodwill. That can be recognized in your consolidated financial statement, but don't worry that one that is not part of your syllabus. So generally, internally generated intangibles, your goodwill, your reputation, those things, your good brand name, you can't recognize it. However, there's an exception for research and development. When your own company does some new research and develop a product or develop something innovative, some, something uh, unique, that can be capitalized. Research costs can never be capitalized. Research costs are basic investigation costs, so that must be written off to the PNA. So remember, no written research cost can be capitalized as an intangible asset. However, after research, whatever the development cost to, to, to design the, the new model of the motor vehicle or to design the new computer software technology, whatever you spend on development cost, can be capitalized provided it meets certain criteria. I'm going to talk about the certain criteria in a minute. If it meets certain criteria, then capitalize, don't write it off. So, these are the criteria. The development expenditure, whatever you incur, should be reliably measured. The particular design or the product or the innovation is technically feasible. And you have enough that you have, you have, your intention is to uh, develop the product. 
so that it can be either used in your business or you can sell it to another party. You can demonstrate, you can prove that it is going to bring future economic benefits. For example, you develop a new uh, car model, which is going to be low consumption on petrol or something like that. So you develop, develop, develop all that development expenditure can be capitalized, provided you find that the car can be produced and it can be sold and you can make profit. So you have to prove it. If it is going to be a loss making thing, you can't capitalize it. So the, your model that what you are going to develop is going to develop, bring new future economic profit. And you have already spent 100 million. You need another 20 million to spend. You must prove that you have enough financial resources. And to develop that, you need these so-called people, the technical people, and those people are available. If the key technical people are left, then you can't capitalize it. So there are criteria to be met. If all these criteria is met, internally generated intangible asset is one of the development costs which can be capitalized. So this will be dealt in your P1, P2, uh, sorry, F1, P2, F2 later. But for the moment, if you know the fundamentals, that's good. Enough. As I said, intangibles we amortize, tangibles we depreciate with a finite life period, a specific life period, five years, six years, we will, uh, we will uh, amortize it over the life period. And whatever the charge, we'll go to the PNL, debit PNL with the amortization charge, credit provision for amortization, it will go on like the depreciate, depreciation. Anything of infinite life, where you don't have a particular life period to end it, it will be every year tested for impairment. If there's an impairment, it will be charged. No impairment, don't charge it. But if it has gone up, don't bring it up. You can't take credit for unrealized profit, but whatever that is uh, depreciated or amortized, that must be the value drop in, that must be charged in the thing immediately. The standard provides that the, the, the revaluation is possible for intangibles, but for it to happen, the intangible must have an active market. So generally, the intangibles don't have a very active market because there are not too many people who want to buy intangibles. And uh, it should be a homogeneous that, you know, all people have the ability to apply that kind of a thing. There are a lot of sellers and a lot of uh, buyers who are bu prepared to buy this intangible. Prices are very transparent, available to the public. But you can see none of these things truly exist. And therefore, uh, even though IS-38 permits, generally intangibles are not revalued. So you can take note, intangibles are not generally revalued, even though the standard permits, because there is no active market. You don't have an active market for intangible. So IS-38 says whenever there are intangible assets, you must say what are those intangible assets, patent rights, brand names, copyrights, whatever, the useful life period, the amortization method used, whether it is revaluation method or the historical cost method, the gross value, Original cost minus accumulated amortization, opening figure, closing figure, what you are charged to the PNL, and starting from the opening to the closing, a uh, kind of a movement. This is applicable even for IS 16 tangible lab. So we remember we discussed this impairment of assets, that is when the carrying value and uh, the recoverable amount, there's a difference. When the carrying value is more than the recoverable amount, the difference, we have to write it off under IS 36. The recoverable amount is the net realizable value or value in use, whichever is higher. So that's what we discussed earlier. And that one, uh, the, the, any difference will be the impairment that should be charged to the PNL straight away. You can't carry forward. 
the moment you see an impairment, it must be written off straight away. Goodwill, every year you need to test it for impairment annually. Impairment can happen because there's a technological uh, better thing coming up. The market values have dropped or maybe because of some legal impediment, maybe because of some economic changes, whatever, or maybe some physical damage, whatever there can be impairment of intangible. Sorry. Yeah, disclosure for each class of property, plant, and equipment, just like the intangible, tangible loss, so you have to show the impairment losses, any reversals of losses. Maybe last year you 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 had an impairment loss, but this year you have recovered it. So that can be brought back, and uh, uh, the any impairment loss are recognized in equity directly. All those things must be shown. So these are a few things that we need to know about the IAS 36. So that's a big area which we missed last time, which did not come. I hope today it is all right. Uh, any questions on this area? I want to look at some the, the other area that I discussed that day was the cost of goods sold and inventory. So you remember the format what we had revenue minus cost of sale or cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold for a trading organization For a trading organization, we discussed this one, open in inventory plus purchases minus closing inventory. Right? Open in finished goods plus purchases of finished goods minus closing finished goods is the cost of sale. That we compare with the revenue and then we arrive at cost of sale, sorry, gross profit. In a manufacturing organization, I say, Manufacturing organization is open in inventory plus manufactured cost minus close in inventory of finished goods is your cost of sale. So remember these two, that is how we get the cost of sale. This is a key figure because we compare our revenue with the cost of sale. So for every item that you have sold, we must have a cost. Now remember that is what we call the matching concept. Every item that we have sold, we must have a cost. So if you have sold 10 items, the cost of sales should be for 10 items. If you have sold 100 items, cost of sales should be for 100 items. So you can go on the numbers or you can go on the values. So in big companies, we can't do it on the numbers. We will do with the values. So uh, open inventory is 200,000, purchases are 800,000, close in inventory is 300,000. That means our cost of sales are 200 plus 800,000 minus 300, 700,000. Now the important thing is how to value this inventory. So every year, your closing inventory today is the opening inventory for the next period. So it's a question of valuing closing inventory every year. The moment you start a new business, you will not have any opening inventory. Zero, purchase, zero inventory plus purchases minus closing inventory will be cost of sale. Next year, the closing inventory of this year will be open in inventory and then at the end of the year, again, you will have closing inventory. So the question is the valuation of closing inventory. So you have to value it. You have to physically verify. The auditors will come. Everyone will come. We have to verify the items in the stores and then put a value for it. And the relevant standard we are talking about is the IAS2. 
So this is what I'm going to talk in a minute. So just to sum up some other people, the basic financial transactions are basically, you remember every transaction is recorded in the books of prime entry. Books of prime entry are sales day book, purchase day book, sales returns day book, purchase returns day book and the journal and the cash book. Cash book is both a prime entry book and a double entry book or a ledger. Then from the books of prime entry, the transactions are entered into the general ledger. General ledger will have all assets, liabilities, income and expenditure. The items in the general ledger, all assets, liabilities, income and expenditure plus the cash balance will be your trial balance. The balances in the assets account, the balances in the liabilities account, the balances in the income account, the balances in the expenditure account plus the cash balance will be your trial balance. And then we saw something called control accounts. I'll come to that in a minute. The control accounts are simply total accounts because you have hundreds and hundreds of people transacting with you. So if you are going to have every one account in that general ledger, general ledger account will be too big. You can't manage it. So to to do that one, you have a total receivables account, total payables account, and the individual figures of that receivables and the payables account are in what we call memorandum accounts, and those accounts are impersonal accounts, and they will be reconciled. Then the ledgers are balanced off, a trial balance is produced, as I told the trial balance is ledger accounts plus the cash balance. Any errors, you will find certain errors, you will correct it and then finally you have to do certain year end journal entries. So the year end journal entries are mostly depreciation, closing stock. Closing stock, the journal entry will be credit cost of sales, debit inventory, because you have to bring that closing inventory into your balance sheet. So year end adjustments, closing inventory, depreciation accruals and prepayments, whatever you are not paid, irrecoverable debts, whatever you are not going to recover, income tax if it's a company, any provisions and contingent liabilities, any events after the reporting period, you don't, you don't uh, put double entry, but you have to disclose it as notes. So closing inventory adjustment, as I said, you debate inventory, because that will go to the statement of financial position, and you will credit your cost of sale. So the cost of sales will get credited that you is the minus figure. Normally cost of sales is a debit expenditure. Minus closing inventory, closing inventory will be your cost of sale. So as I said, Every sale must be matched with a cost. You can never have a sale without a cost. And that is what we do, the matching concept of matching revenue and cost of sale. So for a trading organization, as I said, open in inventory plus purchases minus close in inventory. For a manufacturing organization, it's open in inventory plus cost of manufacturing minus close in inventory. And we discuss the manufacturing account. The cost of manufacturing is open in raw materials plus raw material purchases minus closing raw material. This is direct materials plus labor cost. These two together we call it prime cost. Then to that we add the factory overhead. Then we do an adjustment for opening work in progress if it is more than the closing work in progress, the difference, we add it up. But if it is less, then we deduct it. And that's what we call cost of manufacture. So IS2, inventory valuation, it's basically the purpose of the standard is to provide the method to treat for valuation of inventory. So how to, rec how to value the closing inventory. So basically, it's the question of what is your cost and what is your write-off and what is your net realizable value. 
So the theory is the inventory should be valued always cost or net realizable value, whichever is lower. Cost or net realizable value, whichever is lower. So that's the way that we value. So, so long as cost is 100, net realizable value is 110, we will value it at 100. But if net realizable value is 90, we will write off the asset from 100 to 90 and we will put it up. So always that is the basis for valuation of inventory. So lower of cost and net realizable value. Net realizable value is the estimated selling price. So sometimes the, the goods are so damaged. Let's assume that we have some item in the warehouse. The cost is 100, but the goods are so damaged, maybe due to flood or whatever, and uh, you can only sell it at 80. But if you want to sell it at 80, you have to do some uh, repairs, some work has to be done. So that is going to give you five. So net realizable value is only 75. In that case, that cost 100 will not apply. We will value the inventory at 75. So there will be one or two questions or more than one or two questions in the valuation of inventory. Remember, cost or net realizable value, whichever is lower. The inventory valuation, there are two methods approved. Earlier there were three methods approved, but now it is two methods, what we call first in, first out and weighted average cost. I want to, before I finish up, I want to look at the, the difference between weighted average and difference between the first in, first out method. Let's assume that you bought some inventory today, not today, beginning of the month, at 100 units, at 8 and 800. Then you bought another 50 units. Hundred and fifty. Then you sold thirty units. So the selling price does not matter because we are working out at cost or net realizable value. So what I want to say is, if I go on first in first out method, when I sell that thirty units, it will go out of the hundred. The first hundred we bought. Out of 130 sold, so we have 70 from that original stock of the original 100. So on the first in, first out, we, we, we set off that 30 against the 100, and then 17 to 8, 60. Then we have 50, the last 50, we have not sold anything. This is your first first valuation, 560 plus 450,010. But if you look at the weighted average, we have 1,000 into 8, 800, 50 into 9, 450. So 150 is worth 1,250. So we can find out cost per unit. Thousand two fifty divided by hundred and fifty. Cost per unit is eight thirty three. We will value the close in stock. Now the close in stock will be hundred and twenty. Hundred and twenty we will value it at eight thirty three. So this is what we call the weighted average method. So they are the valuation is 1000. You have both the methods permitted, first in, first out, and the weighted average you can use, but you have to use it consistently, the same method every year. 
unless you have a very good reason to change it. If you change it, you must disclose the change. It's not a change of accounting policy. You don't need to go and change the comparative figures, but you must disclose the reason for the change. Earlier, there was another method called last in first out, but that is not permitted now. In that case, the, the 30 will go from the 50. So the last 50 which came, the 30 will go. So the original 100 will remain at 8. 800. But the 30 will go out from the last. So we will have only 20. This is if we have a last in first out method. But last in first out is not permitted under IAS 30, IAS 2. But the examiner sometimes might put up the last in first out. You have to say it is not permitted. So they might put up and say inventory can be valued on FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. And they might ask all three are correct. No, only FIFO and weighted average. That finishes my IS2 inventory valuation. I have one more area to go. The area that what we finished last time, but uh, which was not good. So the controlled account. Basically, as I told you, finally what we do is we have many customers. Mr. John, Mr. Peter, all those people are our customers. We have many suppliers. And imagine if you are going to have a separate account for each of these people. Thousands of customers and your trial balance will be very long. You have the rent account, you have the electricity account. They are one account, one rent account, one electricity account, one uh, uh, water account, one salaries account. You are not going to prepare, put the salaries, each individual salary separately. But if you try to put out the customer's account, you can imagine the size of the trial balance. You will have 10,000 customers and even if you are going to have it. So instead of that one, what we do is we try to maintain a controlled account. So from the sales day book, the sales day book will have the sales of the entire month. You can see this figure, the end of the month, this figure can be, you know, all these people who have sold it, it can be 2 million. A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, all those people will be there. If you are going to separately record each of these transactions in your general ledger, you will debit A account. Imagine that you are going to do like this. So there will be a ledger account for A, there will be a ledger account for B, there will be a ledger account for C. All those 10,000, 100,000, 50,000, everything will get recorded. My God, you will never be able to do these transactions like this. So what you do is, before, without doing all that, you add all these sales. Total sales are 2 million. You put one simple entry. Credit sales with 2 million, total amount, you will fit it to trade receivables account 2 million. So instead of having a separate account for A, separate account for B, in your trial balance, you have one simple account. And when the people pay, they will pay you. 
from the cash book you will analyze so in the cash book for example in the debit side it will be 5000 so we will have a total column So we will pay ten thousand. It will go, and there will be many other other uh, cash transactions, cash sales. So cash sales will not come to trade receivables. That you will have it in a separate column. So like that, then the cash book is analyzed. You will find trade receivables. You have received uh, from money uh, seven hundred thousand. What do you do? You have a cash book already debited, so I told you cash book is part and parcel of double entry and prime entry. And I will credit this 700,000 one account, credit receivables account. So, all the people who settle, and finally, if there were no other returns and anything else, you will have a 1 million 300 back. So, rather than having hundreds of thousands of accounts, one figure we have to take it to the trial bank. This will go to the trial bank's total trade receivables 1 million trillion. But you will have separate accounts kept for Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. C outside the ledger, what we call a personal ledger. We will keep it. So if, if some person wants to know what is the amount that A owes, what is the permanent amount B owes, we will go to that personal ledger, get the details but it won't form part of your double entry. It is completely a memorandum account kept totally outside the general ledger. The general ledger will have one flat figure total receivable. Similarly for the suppliers, one flat figure total payable. Whenever you purchase, the total purchases will be credited to the suppliers. Any amount we pay, total payments will be debited to the suppliers. Any sales return, any purchase return, debited to the supplier. Any sales returns, credited to the customer. And finally, this balance we can take it straight to the control, uh, to the trial balance. That is the big idea of the control account. Nothing more, but it facilitates in a way a double check-in because you can check your figures and see how good the figures are. So it's basically a summary, uh, summarize a large number of transactions. Mostly it is done for receivables and payables. I don't think I've uh, seen anything else it's been done, but it is done for the receivables and payables. Rather than having individual accounts in your general ledger system, it's one account, but all the details are available in another personal account, and that account is balance is reconciled with the control account balance. So when you say 1,300,000 is your trade receivable, the individual balances in that personal account, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, should they add up to 1,300,000. Account in entries, debit receivables control account with the full total from the day sales day book, credit sales revenue. Similarly, when you purchase, Total purchases for the particular period, one entry, debit purchases, credit payables, ledger control account. So you can see how uh, how uh, easy the account is. Otherwise, it's going to be too many. If you have one or two customers, you don't need to have a control account. If you have a small business having one, two, three, four customers, you might as well have them separately in the file balance. But if you have thousands of customers, you can't prepare finance because to prepare the financial statements, your basis is trial balance. So if your trial balance is too big, you can't do that fine. You can't you have to add all the figures to put the trade receivable. Because in balance statement of financial position, we have only one trade receivable figure. In statement of financial position, we have only one trade payable figure. We don't have all the details. We should not give all the details. Details must be available internally, but they are not available for outsiders. But you maintain memorandum accounts completely outside the double entry system for each of these accounts, 
and that will be reconciled and that's what we call control account reconciliation. As I said, there may be certain situations where the supplier and the customer are same. You are buying goods from me and I also supply goods for you. So there can be a set of which we call contra entries from the payable set ledger the, to the receivables ledger, I will put one entry because uh, I'm supplying to you 500,000 worth of raw material, but I'm buying from you 700,000 worth of uh, finished food. So the net amount I have to pay you is 200,000. So we cancel it off rather than paying 700, rather than I paying 700 and you paying me 500, we set off. So that we do through the control account contra entry and we saw only a 200,000 net balance. That is what we do in the contract. There can be wrong balances. When you do these things, you will find that the balances are not reconciling. In that case, uh, we have to do error correction, so which we have done. So receivables normally should be always a debit balance. Payables should be always credit balances. But if you find error correction, the, the control accounts reconciliation will show that certain things are wrong, that uh, customer's balance is being shown as a credit balance, uh, supplier's balance being shown as a debit balance, we will correct it. So with that, I come to the end of the, the, the session, what I need to do to cover up. I hope today the recording was clear uh, and uh, I have recorded it. We will have the recording also available. I have put all my slides, all what I did with you all in the drop box. You can have it. I put 75 questions in the question drop box. You can have it. Tomorrow, let's meet at 7.15. I want to do a two-hour session tomorrow on questions, as much as possible questions. Uh, you can go to the drop box, read the questions, please. But if you can't find the drop box, is And email, we will say that all the 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 we will say that the questions are sent to you. I encourage for y'all to read the questions before you come for the uh, session. That will make things. easy for y'all. That will make the things easy for us also. So try to read the questions. Try to bring your answers. So you can quickly put it on the chat box. We will all profit by that kind of a thing. Any questions we have? OK, thanks a lot the, for coming for this extra session. Uh, the slides are available, and recording is available. And uh, yes, yes, Mira. Questions are in the drop box. If you can't find it in the drop box, send me a mail. I will send you the question. Yeah, drop box. I think uh, the Anju has given you the link. You can find out from them uh, the link, and you can get it. But if you can't get it for the moment, you send me a mail, I will give you the question, uh, what we are going to do tomorrow. But the Dropbox, I, I, I saw I can find the Dropbox easily. So I think people should be able to find the Dropbox. So I don't think there is a difficulty. But if there is any difficulty, don't worry for the moment. Uh, we will give you all the questions. So anyone who wants the questions, please send it. Tomorrow, we will meet at 7.15, extra session, very specially to do questions.
I hope to spend two hours with you all doing all the questions. So thank you very much. God bless. Let's meet tomorrow.